Howdy! Welcome to another session of Sitting with Dr. Lobezy. I'm your stand-in host, Donnie Lee. Seems that Dr. Lobezy is on assignment. He has been called by the president to Camp David. Seems, doc, uh, seems President Trump needs a little advice on how to handle the uh, Russian collusion scandal. Anyway, uh, today we're going to be talking about romanticism. And uh, down here I have the learning target. So we're going to define what uh, romanticism is. Look at what caused it uh, and its various features. And then we're going to look at literature and art and see how we uh, can see uh, romanticism uh, reflected. It, this is one of my more favorite um, uh, artistic movements. So, not that you care, but there it is. Okay, so um, the definition, pretty straightforward, literary, musical, artistic movement, spanning a period from 1750 to 1850. What that also coincides with, y'all, is the uh, the start of the Industrial Revolution. And guess what? That's no coincidence. Um, so as an artistic movement, um, the, the emphasis is being placed on imagination, uh, freedom, uh, and emotion, among other things, which we'll be getting into. But it is a direct backlash uh, to the Enlightenment, which was a, uh, a period that focused on the um the power and prominence of reason okay and the scientific method um and the inevitable perfectibility of mankind or, or a person kind i guess to be politically uh correct um anywho the uh other thing that uh it is sort of a, a backlash against is the Industrial Revolution, um, because uh, during this time period, it seems as if man has kind of fallen in love with all their newfangled uh, inventions and uh, are of the mindset that they can band nature to its will, all right? And so the romantics uh, don't necessarily uh, concur. What you see up here is a uh, pendulum, y'all. And you know what a pendulum does. It is what causes uh, time to be recorded on a clock. Um, historians often use pendulums um, in describing history in that uh, there's this fella by the name of Hegel who came up with something called the Hegel's Dialectic, which I'm not going to get into. But the simpler, um, I guess, uh, uh, example would be uh the pendulum and and all that's saying is that uh history kind of goes back and forth and that uh sometimes an event takes place that changes the status quo so drastically that there is a backlash against it okay and so that's all i'm saying is with romanticism there's a backlash against the enlightenment in the industrial revolution Okay, so when we look at uh, some of the features, uh, emotions, obviously, so um, this idea that uh, feeling is important and that feeling has been kind of shoved in the corner like baby, uh, you know, in that movie Dirty Dancing, where baby at the end of the movie, she gets pushed down in the corner and Patrick Swayze comes in and said, nobody puts baby in the corner. Well, these romantic artists are coming around saying nobody puts emotion in the corner um, because that's something that wasn't necessarily uh, uh, prized during the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was about knowledge and reason, and they're all fine and well, but uh, what about emotion, okay? Feelings, and, uh, you know, need to focus on that a little bit, okay? So... Oftentimes, it is our emotions which uh, are the wellspring of creativity, y'all. And so we don't want to necessarily uh, uh, put that in the corner because that stuff's powerful. All right, intuition. Now, here's something that's pretty interesting. And this, again, was pushed in the corner along with uh, emotions. And that was this idea that our rational brain 
uh, interprets our senses, okay? And that's how it uh, uh, understands and perceives the world around us. But uh, there have been uh, many people, not just the romantics, who have suggested that there is uh, other ways to interpret the world around us that do not involve the five senses, okay? And that sometimes we have to rely on uh, our intuition or our gut or something else uh, to figure out what exactly is happening. And I don't know about you, but I've had some experiences where sometimes it's best that I go with my gut, okay? Sometimes your gut is wrong, but if you spend some time trying to develop that, um, there's a field in psychology that, you know, studies ESP, extra sensory perception. And that's what we're talking about, intuition. And that this is uh, the area where truth is most often revealed. And if you go back through uh, history, especially European history, all the way back to the Greeks, the Greek philosophers, uh, especially uh, Plato, uh, Plato's allegory of the cave. I uh, don't know if you're all familiar with it, but it's a very interesting story. And it's one in which these people uh, have been taken prisoner and they've been uh, locked in this uh, cave uh, for so long. And they have their arms bound behind their, their backs and their necks are kind of like uh, in a position where they can't look from the left to the right. The only thing that they can do is look forward and there's these prisoners and they're staring at the wall of this, this cave well behind them on this walkway um well there's a walkway behind them and behind that is a fire and their captors uh oftentimes walk back and forth on this walkway and what that does is that projects these shadows onto uh the wall of the cave okay and they've been in this prison for so long that it becomes reality, okay? And that's their sense of truth. Well, one day, one of these prisoners wiggles himself free and goes out into the daylight and is overcome with emotion because he realizes that there's a whole big, beautiful world out there that he was unaware of. And so he goes back and he unties all of his fellow prisoners and he tells them come outside with me and he explains what this other reality was and uh, they was too scared to go and you know what they did they end up killing this poor fella all right and 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 the allegory is that you know when uh, people are revealed with truth sometimes they don't want to believe it but the idea is that there is a uh, truth there is uh, an alternate reality if you will beyond what our senses are capable of of detecting all right so that's romanticism all right uh if we look at um the importance that nature plays uh this is something that uh, especially during the industrial revolution um nature seems to be uh, the enemy all right and as mankind tries to uh band nature to do its bidding um it, there, there's less of a focus on that and uh, the romantics believe that nature um, is many things all right nature is very important because we come from nature we are uh, as you know we are species we're animal species and that we come from nature and therefore we require nature in it and uh, can replenish our souls and it can help us determine uh, the meaning of life and that uh, there is tremendous inspiration to be drawn from nature, but there are also many mysteries uh, surrounding nature that we are incapable of discovering, okay? And this is very contrary to what the Enlightenment was all about because the Enlightenment said that th these natural systems can be discovered. Um, the Romantics say, no, you can't discover it. In fact, there's a lot of uh, things that go bump in the night uh for lack of a better term uh things that uh are supernatural right supernatural and that uh nature is very powerful and man pales in comparison we are uh little you know little things where nature is gigantic okay and we're indiscriminate little peons 
right? And we don't matter, all right? But uh, nature is very important, okay? And we're going to talk about that. Nationalism uh, is an entirely separate uh, topic, but nationalism erupts during this, not erupts, but comes about. Uh, we talked about with the French Revolution, um, you know, liberty, um, fraternity, um, and how that fraternity was this idea of a brotherhood, uh, and that's what uh, motivated a lot of the Frenchies uh, to fight the and join the military and to fight the the enemies of France. And with, with Napoleon, he unleashed a whole bunch of nationalism, especially in the Germanic states and down there in Spain because of foreign occupation and this idea that uh, people are bound together by their uh, ethnic identity, by their language, by the land that they uh, they and their ancestors lived upon um, and fought and struggled for. And that, that's something that's very powerful. So oftentimes uh, the people who were calling for unification, uh, independence, self-determination, those nationalist people were also very romantic, okay? And then here comes something, religion. Uh, religion seems to sort of be de-emphasized, doesn't really have a home uh, because of the scientific revolution or the enlightenment. And we noticed that we already studied the revival of uh, religion because of deism really wasn't giving people spiritually the kind of nourishment that they needed. So there was a revival with religion, and we specifically looked at uh, Methodism as as a as a response to that. Well, religion again deals with, and this is part of the reason why re religion didn't necessarily have a home during the Enlightenment uh, or the Scientific Revolution, because it's hard to well, it's impossible really to measure uh, your faith. Okay, faith is uh, believing that something exists. Where you when you can't see it or touch it, okay, and you can't measure it, like and and observe it and get data to study. All right, so uh, faith is something that, well, dare I say, intuition comes to play. Uh, it's something that you believe here, right inside, and so that's something that the uh, romantics were very. Um, uh, predisposed to be passionate about, okay? And and they liked that, that people had a very strong faith in God, okay? And then another one, and this is a very interesting, not always uh, universally uh, applicable, but the idea of a unique individual, that people are different, that people are special, and that sometimes uh, instead of try to lump everybody together, we need to Focus on what those uh, individual unique unique qualities will be, all right? And so uh, romantic writers, and this is what we'll be getting into next, uh, oftentimes focused on a new type of hero, okay? Somebody that people don't glorify, but in fact, sometimes people are reviled by this hero because he is different, right? And he is, uh, since he's different, people don't celebrate him that oftentimes these, these people are outcasts. Now, w some people say that the uh, authors that, we begin, that we're going to get into uh, that wrote about these kind of figures wrote about them as a, in, in a way uh, as if they were talking about themselves, like how they just don't fit in this modern world that they uh, belong in a bygone age. And so maybe it's a, you know autobiographical uh novels they're not necessarily fictional although the storyline is all right and uh just you know up here i have an example of edward scissorhands uh and, and, you know that's a modern depiction but you have this guy poor fellow with scissors on the end of his hand so he's definitely misunderstood because every time he wants to give go up to someone give him a hug uh he ends up cutting them and when he cuts them they think he's crazy and that he's trying to kill him and so they run him off okay so that's that's a Edward Scissorhand. He's a very nice fellow. Well, no, he is, but people don't think so. All right. And so here are just some of the other things that we kind of touched on. Folklore, uh, fairy tales, and a belief in uh, things that go bump in the night. So there, here, here's a word that is no longer a four-letter word. Uh, 
superstition. Okay, four letter word, superstition. Uh, ain't, ain't, ain't such a bad thing. Okay, uh, again, because you're relying on intuition, because there's got to be a reason why people have believed all the mysteries and supernatural stories. Uh, there's got to be some truth to it. Okay, so um, romantics thought the imagination was superior to reason as a means to perceive the world. All right, and this uh, generated uh, in people uh, an interest in the past, but it this has already been kind of done before. This this ground has been covered uh, when we talked about the Renaissance. The Renaissance was uh, about rediscovering what the classics, right? The Greco-Roman era. Well, uh, that's not what they're interested in because the Greco-Roman era is what brought forth and in, in, you know indirectly led to scientific revolution and the enlightenment and those well remember those are the enemy of uh the romantics uh to the romantics they want to put the scientific revolution and the enlightenment in the corner with baby right okay so what what era then would they look to well the middle ages and it's funny because that's the age that uh the uh the enlightenment thinkers uh, scorn had the most scorn for because of uh, the lack of education and the uh, overemphasis on faith and, and, and supernatural or superstitious beliefs. So uh, as, as, as fate would have it, the, the, romant, the romantics uh, celebrate that time. And so there's a type of architecture that was uh, prominent during the Middle Ages, and that was Gothic art. And or gothic architecture, and that was you know old churches with long uh, tall spires, okay, and stained glass windows, and these uh, funny little exterior uh, walls called flying buttresses, all right. And so sometimes they celebrated uh, those types of things uh, in their artwork, as as seen here. You see this old uh, dilapidated ruin of a church uh, of a gothic church, okay. So, why, why, why is there this backlash? Well, we talked about the Industrial Revolution, but look at the French Revolution, and and look at the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, I mean, the Enlightenment, in in a way, gives birth to those uh, eras or those events, and uh, you know the the excesses, the quote unquote excesses of the French Revolution eroded people's faith in the inevitability. The inevitable perfectibility of mankind. All right, so um, they don't like the the, the 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 common era, as it were. Okay, so also to better understand uh, the Romantic era, we need to kind of look at the intellectual foundations of it. Okay, and so there's two people that we need to take a look at: Jean Jacques Rousseau, who we talked about uh, on many occasions previously, and then a new fella. A German philosopher by the name of Immanuel Kant. Okay, so uh, you know what's interesting when you look at Rousseau was he was an Enlightenment figure. Okay, well how can somebody that's an Enlightenment figure be also a Romantic? I thought those two don't get along. It's like oil and uh, you know vinegar. They don't mix very well. Well, remember Rousseau was kind of uh, different, and he stood apart from a lot of the other uh, Enlightenment thinkers. Okay, so. That, then, that, and then that should make it a little bit more understandable. Um, so he talked about in his book, Emil, the importance of education and how children need to be loved. And we talked all about that when we were discussing 18th uh, century society and, you know, child rearing and things like that. And I had a good, in, like a good influence on that. But he did, his, his educational ideas uh, are a little wacky, a little little out of the norm, okay, because he talked about that uh, uh, children should just be uh, uh, allowed to kind of explore and discover and that there should be no real parameters placed on them and that uh, uh, they they will discover their originality and uh, their uniqueness and um, through trial and error and that we should just give children a wide berth. Uh, I don't know about that. All right? I'm not real big fan of that, but that's just my personal opinion. Who the heck am I? Uh, I'm nobody. All right. Uh, now we're going to talk about Immanuel Kant. All right. Um, now he was a feller that believed 
that the uh, the brain or the mind was incapable of, well, that the that the that the mind interpreted uh, the world around it and that it categorized information, okay, in two different departments, all right, and uh, the categorization categorization of information uh, dealt with what what our senses can determine, and that was known as um, those things uh, called phenomena, all right, and that the parts of truth and parts of the universe and parts of the world uh, that we can't uh, detect with our normal senses that requires extra sensory perception was known as the nomena, all right, got that? Phenomena, what our senses can detect, and then nomena, what we require ESP in order to detect. Now, how's that? All right, uh, Immanuel Kant is a very uh, significant figure in the world of philosophy because he also uh, talked about the importance, and this is kind of a subtopic, but he, he had a um, theorem for how to determine morality, okay? And a lot of philosophers uh, spend a lot of time uh, trying to figure out a moral code, if you will, and, and his was called the categorical imperative. And so um, I find this interesting in this day and age because uh, as a teacher of uh, adolescents, I oftentimes witness them make decisions that uh, aren't always the most moral. And then I watch them uh, try to uh, explain away or rationalize uh, exactly why they did that, all right? And, you know, let's say, for example, like this never happens, but in the, you know, off off chance that it might, a student gets caught cheating on a test, all right? See, but um, it happens, but if we were to take that, um, you know, decision to cheat and put it through the uh, categorical imperative, this is what Kant says. So if, if, your decision to cheat or not, what you have to do is think about it. If, if you're trying to decide whether or not it's a good idea, whether it's moral or not for you to cheat, this is what you need to do, okay? You need to make a general rule, okay? That cheating under all circumstances is okay, all right? And then go ahead and imagine the world if that were the case, okay? And if Civilization as we know it doesn't collapse as a result of everybody running around and cheating. And maybe I'm overstating it, but, you know, if society or, or civilization isn't adversely affected because now everyone is, there's no, nothing wrong with cheating. So everybody's allowed to cheat. So think that through. Okay. Be a rational individual and think that through and think what the, what the, what the possible, uh, consequences if everyone was allowed to cheat anytime they wanted all right well hopefully a logical person would deduce that that's not a good world that we want to live in and so therefore cheating is morally wrong because we can't make a universal law that says in all cases cheating is acceptable got it Imper categorical imperative okay so there you go there you go. I think that's pretty interesting. I don't know about you. But he also talked, and this is kind of unique for philosophers today at least, uh, but he postulated the existence of God and eternal life. And he talked about uh, reason uh, not being able to prove transcendental truths. Transcendental. That's an interesting uh, term. Transcendental. That means uh, different uh, phases of our own existence, all right? That we have uh, different phases, okay? Obviously, that means our terrestrial life and then our life uh, after, okay? So, anyway, uh, let's go ahead and talk about some literature, okay? So, there's a um, lot of important... Um, authors okay and 
it's not that you're going to have to memorize who all of these authors are. Um, but what's more important to understand kind of what their message is during their work. Okay. So we're going to start with uh, a couple of uh, poets, English poets. Samuel Taylor Coleridge was one. And one of his famous poems, and this is a very famous poem called The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, okay? And uh, this is where th there's, and I don't know if you all know this, but uh, this idea of an albatross, okay? And that the, an albatross is, uh, is a bird that is uh, associated with... Uh, not just bad luck, but uh, people who are cursed. So th it, there's a story about this guy who kills an albatross, this you know beautiful bird, and that he is uh, cursed as a result of it, and that he has to go around wearing this albatross around his neck, and so that meant that you know doom um, faced him everywhere he turned, and and uh, didn't spell too good for those who associated with him either. Okay. But, um, at the end of the, the poem, he repents and then the, the curse is removed and he finally gets to get the albatross from, uh, around his neck taken off. So that's sort of, uh, a, 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 a saying in some circles. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> but probably the more important, of the two English poets is Wordsworth, William Wordsworth. He and Coleridge were good friends and they um, collaborated on um, uh, a series of uh, poems known as the Lyrical Ballads. And what we see is the abandonment of the flowery uh, language or prose that you, you know, is often associated with uh, Shakespearean or Elizabethan literature. For more simple words, uh, but um, still trying to convey uh, more uh, complex um, ideas, lofty ideas, but using uh, simple language, okay? And um, he was uh, somebody that was e extremely um, sensitive to the importance that nature has and the power and beauty that lie within nature, okay? One impulse from a vernal wood may teach you more of man, of moral evil and of good, than all the sages can. To every natural form, rock, fruit, or flower, even the loose stones that cover the highway, I gave a moral life, I saw them feel, or link them to some feeling the great mass, lay bedded in a quickening soul, and all that I beheld respired with inward meaning. Now, that talks about the importance that nature has and the importance of uh, uh, this idea that we can learn to, to be moral and happy by relying on the, you know, the, the beauty of nature, okay? Kind of falling in love with, with nature. Uh, one of the other interesting hallmarks of his work is the, uh, the importance that he places, the value that he places on youth. And uh, conversely, um, all the things that are wrong with society, he blames on being old. Not necessarily, he, not like he's got a axe to grind against old people, but um, he says that when you get old, not only do you get fat, but you get unimaginative and you get cranky. Uh, but uh, when you're young, you believe anything is possible. You're idealistic and <laughs> you're very uh, creative. All right. And that that is something that obviously an author would value creativity. All right. And that, um, you know, age has a tendency to corrupt people. All right, so, you know, uh, there's a certain purity associated with youth. I like that, purity associated with youth. All right, uh, one of the other uh, writers is a Frenchie. 
His name's Victor Hugo, and probably one of the uh, one one of the authors that you you probably should remember. Um, his Hunchback of Notre, Notre Dame uh, is the uh, the story of um, you know the the monster uh, who is uh, is not understood and is uh, Quasimodo, I believe, was his name, and uh, he was. Uh, pretty much reviled by all. Uh, so this is a story where he celebrates that. Um, so that's, uh, again, in keeping, and, you know, if you look at the work of uh, Brahms, Stroker's Dracula, and then uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, similar types of, uh, you know, where the protagonist is uh, uh, is sort of an anti-hero, but yet uh, we, we get uh, insight into their feelings and, you know, uh, you come away with this feeling that you know not everybody that's different is bad so that there's there's definitely some value associated with that there's some other authors here but uh i i'm not going to spend any more time discussing them because um the there's nothing with regard to romantic literature uh as far as uh, the stories or you know uh, the um, the features of romanticism that we need to you know that that is new here. So we're gonna uh, move on, uh, I guess. And I kind of misspoke because there's one, and that's um, Gotha. All right. And so Faust uh, is his masterpiece, and it's a very long uh, dramatic poem, and it's uh, this story about a man who makes a pact with the devil. And he gets, you know, his wishes uh, granted, but, uh, you know, he has to sell his, and in return he has to give his soul uh, to the devil uh, when he dies. And um, he he is able to come, come into uh, some great fortune, but then he finds love and then his, uh, his lover uh, dies and uh, it's a big old mess and then he ends up at the end of the story regretting what he what he has done, but um, in, in this work you get um, with Faust, he is what comes through is this idea that if we spend too much time with our nose in the books, um, we don't really learn too much about life. We may learn a lot of facts, uh, but we don't learn much about the real meaning of life okay so uh, before you burn all your textbooks you got to at least read them first uh, before you burn them I guess but uh, yeah so that is uh, m sort of a subplot within uh, Faust now we're going to talk about romantic art uh, okay so some of the things that we we talked about as far as the features make sure you uh, keep an eye out for them because we're going to go talk about some of the artists and then we're going to look at their work uh separately and uh you know some of the things that you need to look at are nature obviously um supernatural uh religious uh, uh historical medieval uh references so all of those things you need to look at some of the um more famous romantic artist, uh, one is a, a Eugene Delacroix, he's a Frenchie. A um, lot of uh, remote, faraway uh, uh, paintings, very exotic in nature. Uh, so he's he's a prominent figure. So is this uh, Englishman John Constable, uh, known most for uh, his um, uh, landscapes, okay, and uh, how he... Uh, shows a lot of um, people kind of living tranquil existences um, in, in more rural settings, okay? And, and how the natural beauty um, kind of complements their life and they're very at, at peace with nature. And there's this very sublime interconnection between man and nature and oftentimes you see the picture being anointed by God because you see uh, either a rainbow uh, or uh, the sun kind of uh, 
shining through the clouds as if to suggest that that God is is looking down. So that is a uh, a theme within John Constable's work. Uh, so anyway, another fella is uh, Casper David Friedrich, and uh, he he has a tendency. His paintings are often about uh, the natural world, but they also depict uh, scenes that are more uh, rugged, as if to suggest that uh, mankind is insignificant as compared to nature. Um, so it's also designed to show the mysteriousness, the mysterious nature uh, uh, <laughs> of nature, Casper David Friedrich. All right, so here is a uh, painting by this fella named Turner. And it's interesting because what it has is a uh, painting of a locomotive coming across a bridge. And uh, kind of in the background, you can see that the... Uh, that the smoke coming out of the uh, at the top of the, of the uh, locomotive has kind of mucked up the air, and uh, has kind of created this blurred uh, sense of reality. Um, my interpretation, and what I've read about it, there's a couple different ones, but my interpretation is that uh, this is the coming of you know the industrial age, and that uh, there should be a, a certain degree of trepidation. Okay, or concern about uh, you know the the marvels of uh, modern technology. All right, that we should kind of view it um, with, like I said, uh, some trepidation, and and uh, perhaps we shouldn't embrace it fully. All right. Uh, here here's Casper David Friedrich, wander above the sea uh, of fog. Okay, so here you have a young feller. Uh, who has, uh, you know, embarked on a journey. Perhaps this is a metaphor for, you know, he's, he's starting his life and he's looking to, you know, take a, take a bite out of life and, and, and uh, see what he can, you know, uh, accomplish. Uh, in, in, the, in the background, you see uh, rocks jutting out from the clouds or the, uh, the fog, the mist, and that uh, gives the viewer a sense of, leaves the viewer with a sense of mysteriousness, that nature is mysterious, perhaps that our future uh, is unknown, that, uh, you know, we, we have no way of telling the future. Uh, perhaps it says that um, man is, again, insignificant as compared to nature, um, that, you know, the path, uh, forward is, is challenging. Could be just saying that. All right. Here is another one of his um, paintings, Casper David Friedrich, uh, The Polar Sea. What you see is a, um, a vessel, okay, a, um, a 